So that's the little sound I found on the internet of a Bigfoot. You know, the, it kind of, the, 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 the sound I heard was similar to that, but it was more uh, of a threat type of sound than that. That sounded more like a calling. Um, we've got one story on there uh, that we posted earlier this year, so it's not going to be in the archives. It's just in the Bigfoot section. And the title of it is Archaic uh, Japanese in Bigfoot Language. And what's really neat is this man, uh, let's see if I can get his name straight, I think it's Scott Nelson, and his professional career was in um, deciphering different languages and stuff for the Navy. He did that for, I think, like 30 years, and he knows many languages. And he got a hold of one of the uh, recordings that was done by Ron, Ron Moorhead, who has done a lot of um, recording of Bigfoot sounds. And this is, I've, seen, I've heard of several of them, but this one's just incredible. And I would encourage people to listen to it. It really sounds like um, a samurai. In fact, it's labeled samurai chatter. And, um, again, if you just go to the Bigfoot section uh, for this year, and the story is archaic Japanese in Bigfoot language. Um, when you read the story that goes with it and then listen to it, uh, it, it gives you a pretty complete picture. There is language. They, um, uh, Scott Nelson had to slow down the tapes in order to begin to hear uh, the language. And uh, there are, you know, things that are actually in English also. Uh, phrases like, um, I can't quote it off, but it's like this one big foot was mostly interested in food, and it was like, want plenty food. In other words, they'd heard, um, you know, people speaking languages, and they picked up on some of it. Well, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, you know, do you take animals like dogs and stuff. They understand. That doesn't take them very long to understand certain commands and certain words. Especially if it didn't got, you know, especially when it's involved with food, right? Oh, yeah. But, you know, one thing, uh, Mary, about uh, Bigfoot, I really, I don't know if they are as friendly as some people say they are towards humans. I mean, they only want to scare you away. I mean, the Indians talked about uh them actually, you know, taking their tribe members, their women and kids and uh, basically eating them. Uh, you know, I've talked to a couple, you know, tribe members and some of their stories, they, that's what they, you know, believe. But then on the other hand, you know, in the national forest system, since the 1900s to about five years ago, there was like 14,000 people. It vanished. Now, some of them in the park people system. Are bl people are blaming that. Uh, I think it's Polides, if that's the way you pronounce his last name. And I think he's one of the ones that's blaming it on the Bigfoot. Um, I did some interviews with a man who has a cosmic uh, top security clearance. And he said that the, uh, uh, the disappearance of people, especially children, small children, is actually being done by a quite evil race of um, ETs. That's a, that's a possibility because, I oh, mean... He says that's the reason for it, and that the Bigfoot are being uh, falsely accused of that. Well, they could, you know, be blaming them for that reason and not to alarm the people. But, you know, 14,000 people is a oh, lot. And, you know, oh, know, and in some of the cases, like children, like there's one I was reading about where the kid was like maybe 30 feet from, you know, the parents and the parents is, you know, were busy putting their tent up, turned their head. This five year old totally disappeared. Well, they found him a few days later or what was left of him. OK, uh, up on the side of a mountain 15 miles away to get to that mountain 15 miles away, which a five-year-old is not going to be able to do, right. he would have had to cross some major, major rivers uh, that well, even this, a human this, wouldn't be able to cross. Uh, this, this man with the high security clearance, um, he said that some of them uh, refer to this race as the dominators and that certain aspects of our government, which aren't, are kind of on the, which are on the dark side, so to speak, uh, will exchange technology with these with this race of ETs in exchange for um, uh, Food? human beings to eat. Yeah, I and, would. And they you and they prefer um, young uh, children. I would. I guess they taste better. I know that sounds so gory, and I certainly wasn't you know thinking about talking about this tonight, but. Uh, 
um, like I said, the guy has incredible credentials, and I have to consider that might be the case. And even though I've heard about Bigfoot, you know, scaring people off with rocks and things like that, uh, the most of the stories I hear are either they're just simply trying to avoid us. I also have a, a there was a man who a, a was retired military. Well, he had to retire early, so he wasn't an old man. He had a health problem. And he got a small cabin in the mountains not too far from where I live. And I won't go into his whole story, but um, he eventually, I mean, at first heard these sounds of splashing in the in the creek near his house. Uh, eventually, he found out there were two, there was a, a pair of Bigfoot and their two, let's say, teenage children that lived up the mountain uh, behind him, a totally undeveloped area. And he eventually made friends with the male. Um, when the man would go out and work in his garden, uh, the male would eventually come down when he was working in the garden, and uh, he would share food from the garden with him. And uh, that I would consider that very, very uh, peaceful. So... Uh, we have to keep this stuff balanced. Another story that gives a total different perspective is um, uh, a story that comes from Joan Ocean. Now, she is the most recognized dolphin expert in the world. She lives in Hawaii. And she was contacted by somebody here in the continental United States uh, who had Bigfoot on, on their land, and she was contacting Joan to get some hints on how to communicate with the Bigfoot. Eventually, Joan came from Hawaii to the mountains, and um, she was able to make contact with a very evolved group of um, or clan of ETs, and they were able to communicate at a pretty good high level. Uh, one female uh, Sasquatch is what they were calling him um, was like a like a medicine woman or like a healer, and had great knowledge and could even, uh, they could even print in uh, English and also in ancient Irish, I'm going to say it wrong, Ag Agam. It's the old Irish way of writing where they have a, a horizontal line and then they'll make lines vertically uh, both above and below the line and they like represent letters. And it's uh, the same uh, Bigfoot were able to use that language also. So that was a very evolved group of, of ETs, uh, ETs, uh, Bigfoot. Big, big, Bigfoot, so yeah. They are okay. not all the same. And down in Florida, uh, they call them skunk apes. They seem to be smaller, and they don't seem to be um, as intellectual and curious as some of the ones in the Western mountains. How about aggressive, uh, being aggressive? I mean, you know, you talk about like uh, the Yeti and the Himalayas and stuff like that. It's supposed to be really aggressive. But maybe maybe they're aggressive, uh, being aggressive, I should say, is because of what we've done to them, you know, back 150 years ago, 200 years ago, as we were settling this country. The same thing as we did to like the buffalo and stuff. We made them almost virtually extinct. You, right. know? you know, maybe they, they, they're totally uh, fearful of man. And their space is being infringed upon more and more and more. And so where can they go? It's like they're down to their last acre and and they have all the more reason to want to protect it. Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize where I even moved uh, 20 years ago. You know, I, I moved in a, a rural area, which there was virtually no houses. And, it was, and my property has almost two acres of, of cedar trees, but everything down my road to, uh, 20 years ago was all forest, you know, and then gradually every couple of years, somebody bought property. The first thing they did is logged it out. Now, probably in this uh, area, I'm one of the, the few people that have a lot of cedar trees left. Like a, you walk out my yard and go past the horses, you're in a little mini forest. Well, you know, when I first moved here, I had deer. I actually saw a bear and a cub, you know, walking down the street. You know, uh, the only thing I see now, I, very seldom do I see a deer anymore. And, you know, I do see raccoons and possums, and that's about it. I mean, which, 
really don't count for much when you think about other animals. No, but what I'm saying is, as mankind keeps spreading mm-hmm. out, the the animals or the wildlife, they keep, they have to go farther out, but then they get trapped. Where, where do they go? And I think that's where they begin to be more de- defensive. And then we have idiots um, that go out there and they just want to trophy hunt. Um, the Bigfoot, I think, have the advantage of being... Um, telepathic. I think they can sense um, what people are about. I think they can uh, sense trouble coming long before we know that they know. And I think they do They, they do a pretty good job of avoiding these guys that have a, a gun over their shoulder and want to shoot them. Well, I had a guest on my show here a couple months ago, maybe about four months ago. That's what his idea was this summer. You know, he lives up near Mount Rainier, up in Washington. His idea, him and a bunch of buddies were going to go, you know, on a trip for about a month out in the woods and uh, find a Bigfoot and shoot it and bring it in to, you know, show people. Uh, You know, and I said, well, before you do that, you know, you look at you could be charged with murder. I mean, depending on the DNA. You know, from the other standpoint, I mean, you know, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to go kill something? And there are some people who have aimed a gun at a Bigfoot and made contact with the face uh, of the Bigfoot and saw such humanness in the face that they couldn't shoot. Yeah, I know. I, I remember the face real well. I mean, looking through through a telephoto, and and it it does resemble not so. You know, a lot of people say they look like an ape. They, I would say they look more more human than ape. But they, you know, they they. I don't know. Uh, I I only looked at the face for a split second before I took off running. Well, you know, as much as I'm interested in in the whole subject, I think if one suddenly popped its face at my window right here, I probably would you know, be freaked out, even though I, you know, have learned quite a bit about the Bigfoot. I think it still would scare most people. Well, you know, after me and my friend, uh, who was a medical doctor, we ran into that one up in the Canadian Rockies. You know, we had to drive about maybe 10, 15 miles, and we came across a little store, and we were really shook up, and the owner of the store uh, knew that we were shook up. And uh, I said, well, we saw this thing. It was about like eight to 10 feet tall. And he goes, you know, you're saying it's a bear? And I go, it didn't look like a bear. And he goes, well, we've had a lot of uh, sightings up here, Bigfoot. But he says, you know, if you're out there with only a camera and no weapons, you're crazy. And I go, why? Because he said, between the bears and they feel the Bigfoot, uh, they have found partially eaten humans out there it went out hunting or went out in the woods and mm-hmm. you know and all of a sudden were attacked by either a bear or a bigfoot or something and were partially eaten so i mean you know that uh that now, was a- i honestly i haven't gotten any stories like that around here none at all uh we see the footprints we see uh evidence of them trying to um you know avoid us uh, the own, the closest thing we had to anything that might be considered uh, violent, um, and if people want to read this story, just type in uh, Valley of the Bigfoot in our search bar and they can find it. Um, this goes back a, a couple of years. And uh, there's this place up in the mountains where, you, you know, it's, to get there you go down uh, a one-lane gravel little road that, goes along the side of a creek and when you get to the end of it it opens up into like a bowl-shaped little valley and there's three houses yeah let's see two houses and a barn and a pond and they one man was out there with a jackhammer um, trying to do something to the pond and all of a sudden the um, jack went right into something hollow and the water started pouring down this hole well after that these people had all sorts of trouble with the Bigfoot. In hindsight, they figured out that um, there's caves in that area, and when this jackhammer went through, they must have flooded a cave that these Bigfoot lived in, and they were pissed. I would and be. They started, yeah, yeah, and we we had a lot of photos of what they did, you know, tearing up doors and. Um, they, you know, they did stuff to the cars, and they, you know, got into a house, and they did all sorts of things. Uh, we eventually went out there another time with a woman who was quite good at 
like telepathically communicating, and she went out to where the the pond and the the dam are located, and she began to communicate telepathically that that wasn't intended and and all this kind of stuff. And the the real 